I hate IWB events. It's like we're always having these additional things on our shoulders that we have to prove. Um, and I'm done with that. The rules of the world are set up for me to feel like a failure and burnout if I try to pursue both the idolized career professional pursuits and the ideal caregiving sense. Eldest born Aries, first child student council president, um, A-type, ambitious to a fault. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is amazing. And I still see the numbers going up. And... Uh, it is incredible that you are all here, including my mom and dad. Hello. Uh, this event came to me four weeks ago. I was sitting on the couch after the girls had come to bed. First thing that popped in my scroll was, oh, IEWD, this thing is happening. I was like, oops, sorry. I thought it might have been loud and I banged my table. I won't do that again. I hate IEWD events. And that is what I was thinking four weeks ago. And I was like, oh, well, why don't I just do my own? And so here we are. It is amazing that we can be together. And in fact, I was reflecting this event is actually 40 years in the making. I turned 40 last year and my whole life, I have been an exceptional rule follower. Get good grades, sit up straight, get into the right school, find the right job, strive for the promotion, get the pay increase, lean in, do it, perfection, hustle, grit, da 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 da. I imagine you are like me, and you've seen that. You you've been there too, and it worked. It it worked for a long time until it didn't. And for me, that time came when I had kids, and I realized. And here's the key insight for today, which is. The rules of the world are set up for me to feel like a failure and burnout if I try to pursue both the idolized career professional pursuits and the ideal caregiving status. Those two for me just didn't work. And it wasn't until I was able to block out all of those rules and by rules, and we'll talk more about this, but I mean everything from like the macroeconomic ways that we measure gross domestic output and productivity down to the very like implicit don't microwave fish in the office microwave. Um, we are with rules, regulations, laws, norms, what we see on TV, what we hear, what we read, everything that promotes this one way of being. I realized that unless I was able to block that stuff out and love me for myself and not the external trophies or accolades or norms and priorities, it wasn't until I was able to do that that I was able to be comfortable in life and my sweats. Mm -hmm. And so that is what we're going to talk about today and so much more. Um, and I agree, Jill, no more fish in the microwaves, particularly with my allergy. So I have questions. Let's dive in and, and get started. And I hope you all enjoy my technically savvy <laughs> slides. Um, I want to do a one word check in. Where am I finding you all today? What's one word? For me, it's adrenaline. For you, it may be exhausted. It may be tired. It may be excited, fulfilled, whatever it is. There's no one right or wrong answer. Type it in the chat. Um, where am I finding you today? Amazing. Overwhelmed. Yeah, got it. Pumped. Hopeful. I love it. Vacation Friday. Like Amazing. Okay, next question. How focused do you intend to be? So one to seven, no right or wrong answer. I just have one request for you. Is there one thing that you can do? One tab you can close, phone put on silent, changing of rooms that you can do to hit this number? We've got an hour together, 50 minutes now. Um, let's make it worthwhile. Okay. Next question. How open are you to challenging yourself? As I have not very explicitly alluded to or talked about, there is, this is about challenging the status quo. This is about questioning our surroundings, our realities, our assumptions, our expectations of ourselves. And again, no right or wrong, but just where am I finding you? Where And, and check in with yourself. How are you feeling? Okay. Um, finally, oh, I saw a hundred. I love it. I love it. Um, again, uh, last question. Um, what is one thing that will make today meaningful for you? Just one thing. Let's define it, set it out there. Also super helpful for me to know. I love it. Connection, have fun, awareness, feeling understood. Yes. A beautiful solidarity. Great, 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 great. Okay. Um, I am loving seeing the chat. 
come uh, alive. And that is exactly the rule for the chat is to use it, please. Um, so two things. One is, as you have questions, um, please put them in there. Jill, who has been, uh, who's helping me today and has been a helpful uh, spirit of sparkle and joy in my life for 10 years, um, uh, is, <laughs> hi, Jill. Um, she's in the chat. She's watching it. And um, so please put your questions in the chat that you want to hear from the women and I. And second, as I ask questions, I've got a few prepared, and then we're going to dive into yours. As I ask questions, share your own thoughts. Uh, I kind of uh, want to think about this a little bit like a community journal. There is, um, and, and that is another important point that I want to make, which is there is no one right answer. There is no silver bullet, fad diet, app, mentorship program, one quick tip or trick that will suffice to address what is happening and what we're talking about here today. Um, for two reasons. One is this is complex and multifaceted. And two, we are all unique, right? So what you may need, what works for one person isn't necessarily going to be what is needed for you. Um, one other thing that I want to uh, address before we dive in is, is my gratitude and my acknowledgement of my, my privilege and um, our ability to talk about this. There are far graver um, issues, particularly that I am thoughtful of on International Women's Day, female genital mutilation, fertility, um, domestic violence, I can go on. And um, I share this and I want to like acknowledge it for two reasons. One is to encourage us. So with the energy that we're going to get from this, how do we take that and go address that other stuff? And two is to release us from guilt. I want to say that like what we're going to talk about isn't polished complaining and invalid because it isn't as grave as other things that are still going on. And so um, release ourselves of that guilt and 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 let's talk and 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 really um get meaning for ourselves and not feel bad about it. Okay. Uh last piece of housekeeping which is I want to give a shout out to all of those that brought you here today. Um there were a bunch of supporters that spread the word. So Jill, if you can do me a awesome a, a favor and put the links of the supporters in the chat. There are links for an amazing coach for uh, child care, for uh, leadership training, for software development. Have a look, please. Or even if you'd like, copy and paste this and, and look afterwards. Um, if you'd like an intro to any of them, please let me know if it would be meaningful for you or for your organization. All right, that's it. That's what I have to share. Let us get into the conversation. Jill, can you help me in spotlighting Amanda, Melissa, Ashley and Rochelle. You got it. Just give me one second to locate all these beautiful faces. All right. And yes, shout out to Keep Company. I agree, Rochelle. <laughs> Lots of awesomeness. All right. We just need Amanda and then we are, all right. We are ready to go. Let's get it into it. Okay. First question, oh thing that I want to talk about is past us and today us and uh, start with who did you think you would be in your 20s today when you think back who you thought you would be today what was how would you define yourself as successful how would you think you would feel about yourself um what did you think who did you think you would be in your 20s amanda do you want to kick us off Oh, I had to ask you to unmute. Well, that I was like, helpful. give me my voice on IWD. I need a voice. <laughs> Here you go. Uh, okay, so who did I think? I mean, listen, I I will I come to you today from the land of eldest born Aries, first child, student council president, um, A type ambitious to a fault, heteronormativity compulsory at place. 
So I come from the land of I needed to go to university, get a job, get married, have kids, get a house, also run a company, also make a lot of money and get it all done by I was 25. And uh, you'll be shocked to learn I did those things. I did those things. I am very few of those things now. Okay. Okay. So we're going to get to today, but um, sounds like there was a little bit of self pressure put on yourself in your twenties. Uh-huh. You know, yeah, I, I really came from a from a, a place of I can't even tell you where it came from. I, I wish I knew where. It, like, there's so many different touch points. It's probably Seventeen magazine's fault, frankly. But I, I just really see that there. I believed there was one path to success and there was one way in which I would be loved and that I was worthy and that I could be accepted. And that was to check as many of those life milestones off as quickly and as externally validating as possible. And a whole lot of my identity was wrapped up in that for many years. I can feel that mm-hmm. there's a lot of uh, uh, connection to that. Uh, Ashley, where, who, who are you supposed to be uh, by now? When you back in your twenties, when you were in your twenties, who did you think? Yeah, I um, I mean, I was going to be this. I was going to be wildly financially successful, business successful. I wanted to be externally validated as smart. I wanted to change the world. I also kind of want to be super fun and be seen as like lighthearted and easygoing, like go to all the parties, go on envy inducing adventures, um, but also be like super sexy and alluring and strong and fit and have a rock solid partnership with a man who was not intimidated by my greatness. Um, I thought about it in that way. And it's like, shit, I wanted to be like Amelia Earhart, Roberta Bondar, Jane Goodall and Taylor Swift all together. And I know there's a few people who knew me in my twenties on this call and uh, I'm sorry. (laughs) <laughs> I feel like I brought a lot of that energy. Like I will, like anything less than that was unacceptable. I was, I mean, I wish I was joking about trying to be all those things, but uh, those were the expectations I had for myself at that time. Yeah, that's the thing. Where are you today? You shared, you shared, you shared with me the other day, three words. Oh my gosh. So uh, my only goal, my only goal is to be, gentle, loving, compassionate for myself, for others. But like, that is it. I want to move slowly. I Mm. want to be a human being, not so much a human doing. Ooh, I like that. I like that. Mic drops, um, but in like a very gentle way. Um, Rochelle, uh, where are you? Where, like, what are you, if today, what are your expectations of yourself? Yeah, no, I completely resonate with both the ladies. And I would say that I 100% am slowing down. I love that word, slow living. Someone said that in the chat as well. It's like, you're on the speed going in your 20s. Like, I don't know what the race is, but we're racing to somewhere. And for me, I'm like, shit, I'm tired. I got four kids. I cannot keep up with this no more. So I personally feel like I am in that, present mode where it's like I don't even know what's happening tomorrow it's on my calendar but I'm not even gonna think about it because I'm here today what is the best version of me that I can be in this moment whether my kid is sick whether I'm exhausted because I just got a puppy which is true (laughs) whether I am you know burnt out whatever the case may be it's more so how can I slow down and be intentional with this purpose and this who's in front of me what's in front of me um, the people that are in front of me the people that I care about um, that's most important to me. So if I've done that for the day, damn, checked it off the list. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Um, gen- being very gentle on yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Melissa, where, where, what's, what's your speed in your twenties? Not in your twenties, in your todays. Why did I even say that? You were about to correct me, weren't you? Oh, No, heard nothing. 
damn it, Zoom, why can't you do this after four years post-COVID? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Luckily, we're setting ourselves up to be imperfect. So it's yeah, okay. Yeah, we're not. We can't hear you. So I'm going to actually share something as well, which was one of the things today, my new expectation of myself is that I'm not going to be exceptional. That was mm -hmm. like, there was some sort of like fictitious, like, oh, exceptional. Then I will, this is what I want to achieve. And yeah, um, yeah. I don't need to, and, and related to that, someone had told me this, this concept that when we're born, we're born with this idea that we deserve to be loved regardless, mm -hmm. that um, just because we breathe, we deserve love. And then as time goes on, you start to learn, oh, no, 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 I got love if I am quiet or I get love if I play the piano nicely or I get love if I yeah. do a nice picture and on and on and on and it culminates. And um, to me, the expectations of myself are I'm not going to be exceptional and I deserve to love, be loved because I breathe. So that's mm -hmm. like something I'm in, in a easier way, easier said than done. But yeah. Yeah. Um, Melissa, how are we finding you on audio? Because I want to ask you know, that these are me? all like, yes, can hear, I can hear you. Beautiful. Okay. And I don't know what that was. I've never had that happen before. Um, so we yeah. are all, we have just said like fabulous, beautiful things. And I think that's like way easier said than done because everything in the world makes us forget that, oh, you should be, yeah. you should love yourself or reminds you that actually you need to be exceptional to get love. So what do you mm -hmm. do? What are you doing to like keep the blinders on and stay focused on these kinds of things that we just talked about? Yeah, for sure. So keeping the blinders on to focus on self love instead of what expectations are around me. I want to make sure I got that right. Cause I was definitely distracted with my audio there for a second. <laughs> All right. So you know what? Here's a great example. Um, last year I set a list of, I'm not even going to call them goals. It was really just investments in myself and things that I wanted to spend time and energy on. Most of which had nothing to do with work or money or boss babe or like fill in the blank, whatever you want. And one of those things is 100% going and singing karaoke with my friend here, Ashley Good. And another one of those things was all it said was go to dance class. That's all I wrote down. Go to dance, right? I kept it super low key. Like we're not moving any mountains here with this goal. And I ended up finding my way to this amazing studio in Toronto. Shout out to the Pink Studio. And I not only attended their dance classes, but I actually signed up for a recital, like a full on the kind of recital that you bring flowers to for your children. And my husband and my son came and I danced. So, and I danced heels and it was so incredible. I met amazing people. It was so empowering. I felt like I was back in my high school days, like dancing on stage. And I loved it so much. I signed up again. And this time I signed up for burlesque, which is like decidedly outside of my comfort zone. So yeah, that's been a big win for me. Amazing. Amazing. And it sounds like that's like a super intentional decision. Like yes. it wasn't like a, like a, a you had to really think about this is what I'm going to do and not going to be striving for. Yeah. Does that intentionality resonate with folks? I got a tattooed on my arm. So I think I'm pretty on that. <laughs> Um, yes, it, if you ladies can see this, it says be intentional. And I did that in year 2020 when I'm like, I need to be intentional with my life because life is so unpredictable and we have one life to live. So yes, hundred percent resonates. I love it. I love it. Um, I'm so, and I'm so grateful that you wore short sleeves today so that we could see that. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Um, okay, I want to shift gears. I want to talk about, because we would not be a very thoughtful, progressive um, conversation, we didn't talk intersectionality, because it's not just about being wom a woman. We have men on here, actually, which I am so psyched that you have joined us, because I actually slightly thought about, like, we should change it from International Women's Day to International Human Beings Day, not robots who can achieve ultimate productivity for the sake of capitalism or whatever. Um, uh, anyways, so mental health, 
um, uh, parental status, race, what have you, who, Michelle, do you want to, can I bring you back to you? Talk to us. Yes. I'm just in this chat, baby. Sorry. (laughs) But yes, a hundred percent. So for me, if anyone who knows me knows that I've always been that very ambitious person, regardless of who I am, background, whatever, but to add fuel to fire, I am the first generation child in my family to go to a post-secondary school and graduate. I was the first to, you know, do a, like get into business, get into a corporate role. My sister went more the healthcare route, but it's like that on top of being a young mother. So I had my babies at 21. My first ch- child at 21 got married at 22. I was a young wife, young mother, young corporate, ex- um, you know, professional and a black woman. <laughs> so put all those things on top of me. It's like I got to prove people wrong about who my stereotypes think I am. Um, I'm not just an uneducated black woman that had a child young. I'm not just, you know, the first kid to go off to school and prove her parents wrong or right. There was so much of that self-imposed pressure on myself that it's like on top of motherhood, I had to, again, show up well-spoken Rochelle at work because I'm the black girl. I can't get, you know, that angry black woman vibe. I can't do certain things. It was just a lot. Um, And for me, it's still happening. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm still dealing with this every single day. But I feel that as I've grown into the woman that I am now doing the work on myself and just letting the reins go a little bit, I realize that I get to show up where and who and how I want to show up because of the person that I am, not the color of my skin, not because I have four children or if I'm married or not, if X, Y, and Z. It's like, I am an individual who gets to show her brilliance, her light, her energy, and who cares? F the people who feel like they are like, oh, I wasn't not expecting that. Or, oh, you're very well spoken for a black girl. <laughs> um, yes. Um, it's just something that I 100% can relate to. And I feel that there's so many other women, um, whether you're black or not, or whatever background you are, religion you are, it's like, we're always having these additional things on our shoulders that we have to prove. Um, and I'm done with that. I'm, I'm really wanting us to move forward into stepping into this is what you get. Take it or leave it. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Put all yeah. the ex- put, take off all the expectations off of you. Yeah, um, Amanda, do you want to share? Are you? Why are you muted again? Ah! <laughs> Damn it! I think it's because I keep following. I, I'm I'm a rule follower, and when you're done speaking, you mute again. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can stand mute. Fuck that. Fuck that. <laughs> um, okay, listen, like. I'm on a gender journey as it is, right? So it's, you know, I have lots of feelings about IWD and how important it is and how we have to stand up for women and for feminist organizations and gender diverse individuals. And I consider myself a gender diverse individual who is trying to navigate all of these feelings around succeeding and success and what the fuck success even means to me And also right now I'm in a fundraising role. You know, I've been in a fundraising role for, I don't know, nine months or so. And I've raised millions of dollars, which is fucking fun. But the number of people who've said to me, you would have raised more if you were a man or that would have went better if you were a man. And it pisses me (laughs) the fuck off because for lots of reasons, but also I'm like, why, why am I not sufficient because I am not a cis white male and I'm fucking great at raising money. (laughs) And I also wonder at times if there are elements of femininity or leaning into a femme identity as I certainly had before in my life that would have aided me in fundraising in a different way. And so this like intersection of gender and sitting in a non-binary questioning state and trying to play very binary roles. Fundraising tends to be that working in non-binary or in non-binary. Working in nonprofit tends mm-hmm. to be very, very much about putting somebody in a box, believe it or not, ironically enough. Um, it is it is hard for me to navigate all of that and push against redefining financial success as the only metric. Uh, and and being okay with my identity, my success, 
my life is being a bit more ambiguous right now and that being fine. That's the journey I'm on. Not, you know, NBD. Uh, not not to mention, and I don't hate me for, or whatever, not to mention the other piece around being a single parent or a co-parent. Yeah, being a single and parent, like, you know, not coming out, right? So I was getting there. How can you travel? Where, where, when, who's going to take care of the kids? Mm-hmm. And oh, yeah. You're right. Thank you for that prompt of reminding that I sometimes forget the amount of people who say to me, <laughs> who's watching the kids. Uh, you know, and lots of people get that, whether you're, uh, you know, queer uh, or not single, but like, yes, I'm a single co parent, uh, you know, and I describe myself as a single co parent. And then sometimes people hear, oh, but you only have your kids 50% of the time. And of course, that's different than somebody who only has their kids or has their kids 100% of the time. That doesn't mean that I'm not carrying all kinds of burdens on labor and identity at all times. Uh, and I'm still trying to do a great job alongside of navigating a professional world that knew me as being married to a man and coming out as queer and and saying I am a single parent who needs help and support at times, but also can get on a plane and go and raise millions of dollars if that's what I need to do. I am all of those things. I kind of want to like give you a hug right now, slash like give you a backpack to put that shit in and put it away. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Um, I think from my end, what I would want to just address quick is is mental health. It's a big theme in our household. Um, My anxiety has definitely been the thing that is soothed by working hard and and following the rules and progressing in that way. And I, it's been that challenge to like be like you know anxiety kind of chill for a minute. Like this isn't how we're going to talk to you. And then certainly when I know those that are very close to me that struggle with depression and it's the whole opposite thing of, I can't measure up. I don't feel, um, uh, I can play, uh, which brings its own sorts of things. So anyways, I think we have, we have, um, effectively, uh, addressed a lot of the facts that it's not just women. It's a lot of things that are happening in our lives. So I love that there are questions coming in. And I'm going to ask you all one more question before Jill. Um, we're going to get to the um, some of the top audience questions. And um, Melissa, start us off with, what do you have enough of? And I ask this question, this to me is really important because we are in like the world of like more, 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 right? And there's never just enough. And I think that that's like, to me, a, a strong act of rebellion when you can say, I've got enough and this is just, I'm cool. So anyways, what do you have enough of in your life? Um, would it be terrible to say children? Um, you know, I say that a little tongue in cheek, but I actually do say that with intention in this space. Um, I made the conscious decision to have one child and a lot of people don't like that choice. A lot of people don't like that choice. And again, from the place of privilege, am I fortunate that I was able to even have that option? Yes, because there's a lot of people in my life that did not. So grateful for that. But my husband and I had really busy lives. We had busy careers, even though that's totally different for me now. Still busy, but different busy. Um, (laughs) And somewhere along the line, I just knew that... I wasn't all that interested in having a brood. And like, Rochelle, I tip my hat to you with your brood of children. <laughs> I got a brood. Yes, I do. <laughs> I told her she was Amazing. crazy. The minute I, I found out she had four children, Ooh. I told her she was bonkers. I was like, what's wrong with and you? A and a puppy. And a puppy. Let's add that in. <laughs> I do not have a puppy. I have one child. He is almost nine. Um, but there are a lot of layers of judgment that come with that choice, yeah. right? Expectations yeah. of women, what that means. Oh, you have it easy. Oh, what's he going to grow up like? He's going to be an only child. So on. we all know it. Right. And so I think even though I was a bit cheeky with my answer, I do think, yeah, I'm brave the rules. I do think, yeah, if I look back, I don't, I don't regret that. I don't regret it. 
right? Yeah. People are like, oh, you're going to regret this when you're older. I'm like, no, we have such a great life. We, I have time to spend with him, right? He's like, mommy, could we have a special day together on Monday? I'm like, you betcha. We're going into medieval times. He doesn't know. I'm so excited, right? It's like, I have the space to do these things with him, which I, I am very grateful for. And it lets That's me feel like I can balance everything. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Ashley, I want to hear more from you. What do you, uh, what do you have mm -hmm. enough of? Everything. Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, this world is is diseased. It's ill. It's a sickness that has befallen us to feel like we have to keep up with this extractive productivity growth obsessed, make you feel lacking in every way at every moment. Like it just it strikes me that that is that is fundamentally a problem that is burning us mm -hmm. all out. That is why you're all here. I know, I know you know that. But it's also like it's it's exhausting our planet too. Like we are catapulting ourselves at breakneck speed towards our own demise and are like caught in this disease that's just it's it's when I think about it, I just I I all I can do is shake my head at how insane we have become. So I, I, I mean, following Melissa's lead, I guess, like a little tongue in cheek saying like, I have enough of everything um, is really like me intentionally, consciously every day fighting all the messages that tell me I'm not enough. Yeah. Sometimes they're from within me. Sometimes they're from without, uh, like really being like, that's no, I am just, I am enough. I have enough. I refuse to seek approval from anyone. And that's my very tiny but radical rebellion Huge. against the disease. Um, yeah, I just refuse to want. Oh, I got all spicy talking like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, thank you. Um, uh, yes. Um, I don't know. I don't like, I don't even know what to, yes, a thousand times over. And now let's get to, I want to hear what the questions are, what questions are coming from folks. Cause I'm looking at my agenda. That's just like slightly, if you can like see my eyes go up and it's, we're like a few minutes over. So I want to do the questions and then more things. Um, Jill, what's, what, where should we start? What's one first question? Okay. So I have found, can you hear me Jess? Yeah. Okay, cool. So I have found one, two, three, four, five, six, six, seven. I'll call it six because two of them are kind of similar questions. How much? Uh, let's, let's start, start with the first one. With the first one. <clears throat> so this one's from Jessica Bennington. Do you think it's important to go through the journey of realizing we don't have to do it all to have that go, go, go to check all the boxes as quickly as possible only to realize you don't? So I guess well, it's, yeah, you have to go through the mm, journey of, yeah. of, kind of, of the suffering almost to then realize, okay, it doesn't have to be this way. Interesting. Yeah. Who anyone has a a quick wants to raise their hand? Or I can please. Yeah. Go I mean, for I, it. It, like to an extent, I do think you there is an element of needing to go through some of the learning. It's hard to it it, it can be hard for me anyway. I, I learn the lessons the best through my own bumps and failures and successes, but definitely through the failures. And so, you know, I, I, I did need to go through a lot of those box checking phases of my life to be able to let it go. I don't know if I could have let it go, honestly, if I hadn't have checked some of them, right. It was, you know, being in a, on track to C-suite marketing at a tech company, it was something I aspired to for a lot of my career, I had to kind of hit it and go, oh, fuck, this sucks in order to be able to walk away from it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how many panels of people being in C-suite marketing and tech companies I could be on telling me it was shit for me to walk away until I did it myself. So I don't know. I hear the sentiment of it, but a little bit, I do think it's it's about like, where is the collective support and community to sort of recognize that it's not all our problems to fix and that we can kind of see this is the system we're operating within and support from within it and then get through the other side. I don't know. I, I don't know if we can avoid it completely, I guess. 
Yeah, I think I think you're right. And I have hope for a future generation. Um, I think mm-hmm. we were very much brought up in the like era of corporate feminism, the the lean in, the and it and it preceded because that only yeah. came out in 2010. So it preceded that. Um, but what is what you see with Gen Zers, I'm like not Gen Gen Zers, and uh, like is is uh, like a a rejection of that. They um, and yeah. so I I think that if we if we can uh, evolve society to not prioritize and put on a pedestal power and wealth, as speaking in like macro terms, and then that all of that that trickles down from it, um, it, it can be changed. But um, yeah, good, good thoughts. Jill, what's your, what's the next question? And while you pull that one up, I saw, um, Sally, I think it was, but, um, uh, not 100% sure, made a, a message to say for the men, uh, that are joining. And if you feel comfortable, share it in the chat around, what are you taking from this? Cause this is very interesting and awesome that we have you joining such a, such a conversation and, and both what are you yeah. taking from this personally and um, in supporting of yourself and overall this, what is defined as women, but I would say it's definitely a human being challenge. Um, Jill, what's the next question? Okay. So the next question is how do we challenge, this is from Cecilia DeCorn. How do we challenge these expectations slash pressures slash challenges and also exist in the current capitalist system? It's hard to totally reject the system. Yep. Yep. Anyone want to take that? Ashley, do you have a, do you have a thought? Oh man, I feel like (laughs) I have so many thoughts on this. How do we, um, yeah, obviously we live in in a capitalist world. You need money to survive. Like, stop um i think there's not like that isn't necessarily uh, what am i trying to say here i think for me it is possible to exist in that system and follow our intuition um see where we feel pressured to be a certain way or give our power away to gain someone else's approval um and instead uh, choose a different path and be confident in choosing a different path. So I, I realize I'm talking in like generalities. Like what I what I mean by that is, you know, if if I'm <laughs> I can listen to my intuition and follow um, follow what lights me up and be gentle with myself, however that pans out. Um, and I think. Yeah, I'm getting a little lost in in the in all the thoughts. So I'd be curious. I don't know. I'm just going to step back and let myself be imperfect with that mess of answer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we we I I give a lot of thought to this. Um, and where I land is that um, I don't necessarily put fault at capitalism. Capitalism can be manifested in many ways, um, mm-hmm. and there and and it's it then comes down to me and how I individually want to choose to live and and like put the blockers out and rec and and not think that I the panacea isn't all of us fly, f- fleeing to the woods to not live in a capitalist society the pan the panacea is is addressing and attaching value to caregiving as an example like we made up the rules of what we value in the stock market right so what is um you know gdp or uh profit or you know um ebitda like like we like fully on made earnings before interest depreciation tax and and uh, appreciation right like or whatever you know like so um we can redefine those rules within capitalism to also say earnings before depreciation, amortization, caregiving expenses, and uh, self-care, as an example. So like, that's where I, um, that's where I land. Uh, Jill, let's do one last question. And then we're going to do breakouts because I want five seconds for you guys to share your voices with each other. Okay, so I mean, this question was asked by one person and echoed by another. I'm not sure. I, I feel like it's kind of an interesting question to sort of round out the session here or the right. question answer period. Perfect. 
but says so much talk in quote in brackets, not just here, about the systemic issues facing women in business, fundraising, et cetera, et cetera. But that's as far as the conversation seems to go. Not the now what, next steps, actions. So that was Karen Richard. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Avery Schwartz replied, uh, yes, this, I see the importance of sharing stories, but what next? What's the action? So I think it's, yeah, that kind of desire for how can we then move forward from these awesome conversations. Perfect. Um, thank you for asking that question. Uh, who has, who wants to go first? What are your, and, and that can include how do you do self-care? What, so I'll set this up broadly, which is to me, the action from here is defining a life and, and, and just sort of pushing out what is all of the noise and deciding for yourself, what is the life I, how I do it is what is the life I want to lead that includes career, caregiving and self-care. And what I do as a daily practice is think about what did I do that fills my cup that involved career stuff, but also caregiving, because before I didn't value that. And I just saw that as a distraction and an impediment to what was a good life and a life well lived. And when I needed to do acts of self-care, whether it be take a nap or a bath or hang out with girlfriends, I'm not talking like massages and whatever. Um, I saw that as a detriment, as a form of weakness. So those to me are my like, so what's next steps um, in, 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 in putting caregiving and self-care as just as important as career. Um, uh, Rochelle. Yeah, I love that sentiment. I'm just going to add to that and do a little quick plug for Keep Company. So if you ladies and everyone, gentlemen, ladies, all the people on here, um, work in a corporation that feels like it's not valuing their caregivers. Keep Company, the work that we do there, and I'm one of their Keep Company coaches, is that we're bridging that gap between caregiving and professional work. And it's like, we need more employers and people who are hiring, nurturing, and, 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 and you know having professionals work for them, support supporting them in both caregiving and work. So as a Keep Company coach, we come together every week or monthly, depending on what part of the program you're in. And we just sit and talk and literally have these types of conversation in a workplace setting, but talking about our children, our marriages or relationships, our self-care or lack of self-care, the things that are bugging us, the things that we want to dismantle and just come together and literally share. And that is so beautiful to see that employers are looking and seeing the value of this type of program, this type of service offering. Um, so that's the, that's step one to me. It's like get these employers, your employers talking about what's what are we missing that we're not nurturing our caregivers? What, you know, whether it's maternally, paternally, people who just came back from a, a leave of absence, what do they need? Um, the people that are burning out, that are feeling disconnected from work, like those types of conversations need to be had and these types of programs are out there. When I found Keep Company, I didn't even know this existed. And the fact that there's this type of service just shows me that we are moving in the right direction. So keep having those conversations at work and outside of work and sharing your resources because one company, one employer who sees the value and shares it with another is like that domino effect. It'll spread, it will grow. Um, And again, it's something that shows the value of caregiving as not just separate from the professional woman or professional man. It's both. It's intertwined. We cannot separate them. I like, I like and and it, it it's just just talking about this is meaningful. Yeah, that that yeah. is. Yeah. Anybody else want to add to that? Amanda, I would, I would add. You know, for me, thinking about, I I need to continue to remind myself that my workaholism is an element of a mental illness that started from the expectations of perfectionism and being enough and being worthy and and hitting those milestones. And it is not easy for me to step away from work. Like I thrive. I have said, just knows this of all my years through running a brick and mortar through COVID productivity is my coping strategy. I lean to work to not feel, and I am most comfortable there. And so step away and just sit with a book is hard for me. 
I know, you know, Avery is active in the chat gardens and posts a lot about gardening as an active hobby that you need to do. I need to do something that isn't work. And it is not simply taking a day off to go to a spa or, you know, it's, it sounds absurd to say it, but it is hard for me to stop working because I lean to that as a way to feel worthy. And, uh, I need examples and accountability and also being paid fairly and capital to be able to step away from work and sustain myself. And I need all of those things to thrive. And it's, it's not just, Oh, take a break. It's like, what does that look like for somebody who feels safest when I am crushing them long days of work? There's a lot there and you, the other word that I'll call it in the chat is was, there's a lot of conversation of mentorship versus capital. And uh, I'll, I'll just call out that, yes, we need capital and it has to come out in different forms. It can't be in the form of you must kill yourself in order to produce returns. It has to be capital that is allocated because uh, it creates the caregiving and self care outcomes, not just the uh, profitable as we've defined it, um, outcomes, because uh, apps for childcare services that create connections with childcare services get more investment and funding uh, over uh, daycares. And that's because of our capitalist structure. And anyways, I could go on and on about this. And I, and I, I appreciate the question, because to me, this is a conversation that is just starting. And I so wish that we um, could spend more time. I want to, though, spend to give you all uh, uh, a few minutes just to connect and and um, share your voice. Um, please, if you are not comfortable for participating in a group, we're just going to do it for literally two minutes. Um, if you are not comfortable, just say I I, I want to not share and just listen, uh, and then everyone please respect that and don't leave. Don't use this as an excuse to peace out of the webinar because we're going to come back. We're going to share something, and then I have just a few more things that I really want everyone to be part of at the end. And so um, please, uh, Jill, if you can put us into breakout rooms. And the question for you is, um, what's one aha and or remaining question that you have, because that is valid too. What is one aha that you have that you're tucking into your pocket um, as you leave uh, when you, when, at the end of today? Jill, can you send us into the abyss? I'm going to be a good agenda bot and close on time. And I want to ask, can everyone share their ahas here so that we can all learn? We're not mm -hmm. going to do a shout out or a readout. Um, Emily, I had the fortune of hearing yours and it was beautiful. So I'm going to actually just share it with everyone, which is um, I am not the problem. The problem is broader than me and external to me. And just understanding that is powerful. Because that then absolves me of trying to fix myself and instead accepting myself and loving myself. Really, this was the theme of, of today, which was just loving who I am today for who I am because I breathe, because I am, and not trying to be um, what everything and everyone expects me to be. Um, and I think opening up the eyes towards the bigger system is step one, I would say, in the change. And that's why I called it rule breaker. I called it rule breaker because we live in these rules. And until we acknowledge that these rules exist, we can't um, then go and change the system. Systemic change doesn't happen through mentorship programs within the existing rules. You have to actually know what the rules are, call them out, which is the rule is the more hours you work, the higher wage you get. So even if you want to mentor me, you can mentor me to the moon and back, but I got to be back at home to water my children because last time I checked, they need daily watering. And so it's just understanding first that these rules exist, that then you can go and change the system. So um, that's why I called it rule breaker. That's what I'm hoping that you got out of this today and knowing that it is the broader rules and not yourself that is the problem and 
The only thing that I have to share with you from here is to me, this is the beginning of the conversation. Um, it has been 40 years in the making, 10 years in the making. I 10 years ago, I wrote a project plan about this. I have been brewing on it too long. So um, I appreciate you all being here and stay tuned for more. And I appreciate you um, coming together and sharing your heart and soul. So um sending goodness your way, not wishing you a happy International Women's Day because it is meant for radical change and not being all like inspirational. Um, please go and enjoy the day. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Ah. Yes, Melissa. Amazing. 